So let's talk a little bit about fly selection and, and choosing the right fly. Now, this is a big thing, and I see this so often. When you're guiding, your guests are with you, and they're like, what fly are we gonna use today? And I look at them and we're like, I don't know, we haven't got down to the river yet. I know, but you were here yesterday, and so what we're using? Well, what we were using yesterday isn't necessarily relevant to what we're gonna use today. I mean, obviously it's more pertinent information than the fly that we used a week ago, but it's important to wait until you get to the water, especially if we're talking about spooky fish, educated fish, pressured fish. We want to see what that specific fish is eating. So the fly that I have to walk from my truck to the river is a placeholder. Wait to rig your rod until you get down to the river and actually see what's hatching. If you're up at your truck and you're covered in mayfly spinners and you put on an exact match to that mayfly spinner, you get down to the water and you see that there's mayflies and fish are sipping, you're casting, you're not catching a thing. Well, that would make a lot of sense to me because depending on the species of the mayfly, a lot of the males, like with blue-winged olives or trichos, the males are a completely different body color than the females. So if you match the body color of the males that never return to the water and never deposit any eggs, well, you might not get any eats at all. Whereas if you waited, you walk down to the river, you watch and see what they're eating. Yes, they are eating trichos. Now you put on a female spinner pattern and you're actually gonna get a lot more success because you're matching what they're eating, not what's up in the trees, okay? Like match the hatch, but make sure you're matching also, like we say, it's always important we gotta match size, profile, and color. Like color's relevant because sometimes color can have a difference in the, in the gender of that species. So it's important that size, profile, and color you got to match the color of the bug that's actually on the water, not just the bugs that hatched, right? Same as profile. If I tied on uh, a adult golden stone, but I threw on a male, well, the profile would be completely different because they don't have the fully formed wings that extend past their body. And so it would be a completely wrong profile, even though it's what's hatching, I need to make sure I'm fishing what's hatching on the water and specifically what the fish is eating it's very, very common that there will be multiple bugs eating at the same time. When there are caddis and PMDs on the water, it is so rare that I will see a trout ignore a caddis and eat a PMD. I've seen it, I think, two times ever where they were ignoring the caddis and they were focusing on the PMDs. That almost never happens. There could be PMDs all over the water and put this rod down before I break it. I, I've seen so many times where there are PMDs all over the water and they're not touching any of them and one caddis comes through and hatches, bang, they eat it right away, right? So you'll get fish that have a favorite bug or they'll get a bug that they're locked into. That's why we talked about earlier, you gotta observe, watch, find out what the fish is eating. Once you know what the fish is eating, then you can go into your fly box and grab a fly for it. Okay, so let's grab a fly box right now and we'll go through this. So when I open this fly box, one of the things that you're gonna see is that there's a bunch of flies missing because it's the end of the season. Um, but this whole row, that whole row, that row, that row, that row, one, two, three, four, five rows are all blue-winged olive imitations, okay? It's October now, so we're late in the season, but that whole month of September, blue-winged olives are a really big hatch and a, an important hatch for us. If I find a fish that is feeding on blue-winged olive nymphs, but we missed them on one bug, I want to have options. I don't want to just have one blue winged olive nymph. That's why I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So I've got a dozen different blue winged olive patterns, not just a dozen blue winged olive flies, a dozen completely different patterns that all imitate a blue winged olive nymph. So if we get a really picky or a really fussy fish, that eats one fly and we miss it, I don't have to show it the same fly again, okay? We're gonna talk a little bit more about when to switch flies and how long you keep a fly on and that stuff later on. But for now, make sure on your important bug hatches, caddis is a super important hatch for us. Stoneflies is a really important hatch for us. Hoppers, um, blue-winged olives, PMDs, ants, beetles, all of those, 
and midges. Sorry, can't forget midges. All of those patterns, I will have multiples of every single one of them. So that if I spook a fish on one fly, or if he takes a look at one pattern and refuses it, or more importantly, I missed a fish on a fly, I have the ability to change and show them a, the same type of fly, but it's a new pattern and it's one he hasn't just seen, and there shouldn't be red flags and alarm bells going off as soon as he sees that fly again. So I just always wanna make sure I have multiple, multiples of every pattern. Let's talk a little bit about fly size. Um, big flies. Little flies. I can promise you at the shop, we sell three dozen of these for every half dozen of these, okay? Most people prefer to throw the biggest, brightest, easiest to see fly. Tons of people say, oh, I don't see that well, I lose the fly in the foam, all those things. So people are throwing the biggest flies possible. Let's think about this. There is no question that trout love big meals. A grasshopper, a stonefly, a big green drake, stuff like that. Some of the biggest bugs we have are some of their favorite foods. And you can tell with the aggressiveness and reckless abandon that they go after those patterns with, they love those big meals. You throw a steak in front of me, I'm gonna be pretty happy too. Now, do I eat rice or steak more often? <laughs> I'm a fishing guide, I've eaten a lot more rice than steak, okay? So, yes, we love a big meal, but at the same time, let's stop and think about this. How many natural grasshoppers do you see floating down the river in a typical day? How many natural stoneflies do you see floating down the river on a typical day? Those are basically the two biggest bugs that we commonly get on our trout streams um, in kind of Western North America. So let's just use those two as an example because we're talking about bugs that can be up to two inches long. Fish love a big meal like that. That's a lot of protein all at once. That's one trip for the surface for exponentially more calories than in all of these. You think one stonefly probably has more food value than all of the little midge patterns in this whole box. That's like four dozen trips to the surface or one trip to the surface. So there's a lot more calories, there's a lot more gain for every time they eat out of these big bugs for a fish. So does that mean we should always fish big bugs? Um, obviously not or we probably wouldn't be talking about this, okay? The majority of people want to throw big flies because A, it's fun to see them come up, and B, they say, I can't see a small fly on the surface of the water. Now, let's go back to that question I posed before. How many natural grasshoppers do you see in, over the course of a day? On some of the best hopper fishing days I've ever had that were absolutely lights out, I would still bet we saw less than five natural grasshoppers in the water floating down. Now, is that because every time they land in the water, they get eaten? Possibly, but let's just think of it from the standpoint of, if I spent 12 hours on the water and I saw not even five, I can count on one hand the number of naturals I'm seeing, and every angler is throwing that big fly. Okay, so now let's go to a highly pressured river, go to one of our mountain streams on a busy, super popular stretch of it, and maybe there's 50 anglers that walk that piece of water that day. I bet you out of those 50 anglers, 48 to 49 of them are throwing a hopper, or if it's stonefly season, they're throwing a stonefly because it's the biggest, easiest to see fly that they can throw. Now, that same day, there's midges, there's always midges hatching. So let's think about the midges. How many midges do you see over the course of the day? Personally, numbers aren't my thing. I'm not gonna be able to keep track. There's days where you can see thousands. There are certainly days where you can see tens of thousands of natural midges on the water. Now consider that exact same super busy stretch of river that sees all this foot traffic, all these anglers, 
And the majority of those anglers are fishing the biggest, easiest to see fly. So now the fish are seeing the highest number of naturals in really small bugs, like midges and ants and beetles and trichos and all the stuff that nobody else wants to fish. So that's what they're seeing the most of, but what are they seeing the fewest artificials? Those small ones. So the most artificials that the fish see are the big bugs and the fewest naturals they see are the big bugs. Why wouldn't we try and fish the flip side of it? Right? And the reason being is just fish what everybody else isn't. Fish what is safe to the fish. If where you fish, everyone fishes a size 24 midge pattern, and that's what everybody fishes, then maybe a size six hopper is the best thing you could possibly ever throw. But just throwing what everyone else is throwing is gonna make it way more difficult for you to catch a fussy, educated, spooky, pressured fish. If you wanna catch a fish behind somebody else, if you wanna watch somebody walk through a run, fish it, and then walk right in behind them and pick off fish after fish after fish. Don't do the exact same thing and expect a different result. It's literally the definition of stupidity. If you do the exact same thing that everyone else has done, you should not expect a different result. Maybe you can throw a better cast. Maybe you can get a better drift and you're gonna mend better and all those things. So you'll pick up a few fish that they didn't. But if you're doing the exact same thing, showing the fish the exact same fly, you can't expect a dramatically different result. If everyone throws small, try throwing big. If everyone is throwing giant big foam bugs, throw something small, throw something natural, throw a cripple, throw something different, a spent spinner, throw something that everyone else isn't. I can promise you of the tens or hundreds of thousands of flies that we've sold out of the shop, the fewest number of them are the flies size 20 and smaller, cripples, spent spinner patterns. Like those aren't your typical bugs, but the fish see them all the time. The fish eat them all the time. When you're picking your fly, start with what the fish are eating. And then the second consideration I would say is try and throw something that everyone else isn't throwing. If you don't know what anyone else is throwing, then you just got to make a decision based on what the fish are eating. If you're fishing somewhere that's super highly pressured and you can see their fly from 70 yards down river, well, there's a good chance it's a big foam bug. Try something really small. If you can't see any of the flies people are throwing and every fly is coming in and landing super soft and delicate, chances are everybody around you is throwing really small stuff. Try throwing something bigger, right? Try something different. Otherwise, you should not expect a different result. One other thing I want to talk about when it comes to fly size. So big bugs, little bugs. This is my hopper dropper box, um, dry dropper. If I'm throwing a big fly, it has to land with more splash than if I throw a little fly, right? If I'm dealing with a tail out or a pool that's really calm on the surface, or a nice run on the bow and there's fish sipping, whether it's evening or middle of the day and they're on trichos or olives. If it's super calm and I throw a big fly and it lands with a big splash, I could put that fish down immediately. That's the other reason why fishing small bugs can be a safer bet. If I find out that they don't want the smaller bug, that's fine, I can always go bigger. But if you start big and you spook the fish, it's really hard to then go smaller because it's fine, you can throw on a smaller fly, but if you spook the fish, you're already done, right? Whereas if I start small and gradually work my way up, maybe I start with a size 20 ant and the fish completely ignores it. Maybe I put on a trico in a size 18 and they ignore that. I go up to a size 16 caddis and they ignore that. And then I throw a grasshopper and he eats it first take. That's fine because I started small and I haven't spooked the fish. But if that fish was keyed in on something really small and it was looking for size 20s and it's sitting very close to the surface and I slap a big hopper in front of it, that fish could be spooked and it's gone. I don't have the opportunity to downsize anymore because I've already screwed myself. I spooked that fish. So start small and go big versus starting too big and then wishing you hadn't.
couple other things to, to talk about when we're considering fly selection. So let's let's grab a nymph box here. So here's here's a bunch of droppers. If I see a fish feeding subsurface and I can see the white of its mouth, I know it's eating nymphs. That's really hard for me. I mean, maybe you have much better eyesight than I do, but it's really hard for me to look into the water and be like, oh, he's eating a size 18 PMD nymph, or no, that was a blue and olive nymph. That's gonna be really hard for me to see. So when it comes to fishing, like if I'm sight fishing with just a nymph alone, or if I'm fishing it with a dry dropper set up, you're not always gonna know what insect they're keen in on. If I happen to see blue winged olives coming off, and I see a fish that's opening its mouth, and I see the white of its mouth, the white of a fish in its mouth is a cue that it just ate. So if I see it eat, or if you see a fish holding and it changes its line, that's a cue that a fish just ate. So if I see it moving back and forth nymphing, I need to pick a nymph. People say, do you want bright flies on bright days and drab flies on dry, on drab days? I don't know what a drab day is. Bright flies on bright days and a drab fly on an overcast or a cloudy day like what we have right now. Today we've got a mix that keeps changing from sunny to cloudy, sunny to cloudy. That happens all the time when you're fishing. Typically on pressured fish, I will always start with something drab and more natural before I go to really bright. If I've tried all of my natural flies and all of those drab flies and I didn't get a reaction out of the fish, then I might go to flies that are bright and shiny or flies that are purple. Like I've got a lot of different blue winged olive imitations. Some of them are very drab and natural. Some of them have a very flashy bright body. If it's really bright out and I've got a really spooky fish, that will not be my first fly that I, I pick. I'm gonna go with something more natural. If I can't get them to move on anything or I can't get a reaction or the water's stained and dirty, then I might go with a brighter fly to try and get their attention. But again, you can always go brighter with your fly color, just like you can always go bigger with your fly size. But if you start too bright at the beginning and you spook that fish and put it off, you don't have the option of going more drab at that point because it's done. So I always start drab and then work to bright. The last thing I'll say about flies is, um, I, I understand not everyone ties flies. And so not everyone can go to the river with a custom fly that n no fish has ever seen. That can be very beneficial. Now granted, there are some e extremely proven effective patterns that outfish virtually everything else. It's always a good idea to ask at a shot what's been working. A lot of people I, I get are worried about asking or intimidated to ask. There is no place that you should feel more comfortable asking what fly should I put on than at a fly shop because that's the very reason that they're in business. The only reason our shop stays in business is to help people, right? Like you should never feel like you need to know the answer to that question before you go into the shop and you have to be able to pick your flies yourself. The other thing you'll see people do is they gravitate to the bin that is almost empty because, oh, if, if the flies are low here, it must be that this is the hot fly. That could be true, but it could also be a fly pattern that the fly shop's not gonna restock because it hasn't worked well enough, and so they're not gonna buy it again. Or it could be a fly that they're just out of and they're not able to restock, and they don't need to restock that bin very often, and they've got a fly, like we've got bins and flies at the shop that like in peak stonefly season, there are certain patterns that we have to restock four and five times a day because you can't fit any more of those big foam flies in the little bins and we sell them that fast. If you come in and just look at, well, that bin's crammed to the top, that would suggest that it's not being purchased a lot, but it's literally being restocked four and five times a day and the one right beside it that's really low, I'm gonna call that pattern because I liked it, I liked the look of it, we brought it in, it didn't work well, so I'm not gonna bring it in again. So it's always a good idea to ask and get that I, and, and get that information from the shop. One of the things that's also important there is we try and recommend different patterns for people. When I fish, when I'm not guiding, I will commonly, when the river's fishing well, we catch a fish, you get two fish in the fly, and then the fly comes off. I'll even do that when I'm guiding and I get 
guests that look at me like I'm nuts because they caught a fish of a lifetime. I'm like, cool, let's take that fly off. And they're like, excuse me? But you don't learn anything new if you don't try anything new. And so I will take a fly off and try another stonefly pattern. If they're hitting stoneflies, I'll keep up with stoneflies, but I'll change the pattern. If they're on hoppers that day, I'll change the hopper pattern. Maybe I'll try a bigger one. Maybe I'll try a completely different colored one. It's amazing how often that change can make a difference. I remember a day that I was guiding guests that I fished with for a lot of years. So it's a grandfather and his grandson. Started fishing with the grandson when he was seven. He's now in university. We were hopper fishing. We had a fish reject a fly. So I stopped, I anchored, I changed up the grandfather's fly. And the grandson in the back had just been casting continuously. And he'd probably put 30 casts over that fish. And I'm like, hey, well, this fish is clearly done because it's had 30 casts over top of it. But what I'll do is we'll change flies and we'll float down river and hopefully a different fish, you know, is gonna eat this fly instead of coming up, looking at it and refusing it. The whole time I was retying, that grandson had probably put three dozen casts over that fish. The first cast that that grandfather put over that same fish with a different colored hopper, it was literally the exact same pattern and just a different colored underbody. A 22 inch brown trout that had refused to fly earlier came up with no hesitation and ate that fly immediately, right? So that tells you color mattered. The size was the same, the profile was identical. It was literally the exact same, more or less hopper. That's the pattern. Changed the color and the fish ate immediately. So sometimes just fishing the color that everyone else isn't can make a huge difference. When I look at the flies that we sell the most of, hands down hoppers, it's tan. The yellows, the olives, the bright greens, the grays, those don't get fished anywhere near as much and those can be so effective. You pick up a hopper and you turn it over, some have bright blue legs, some have bright red legs, some are tan, some are brown, some are rust colored. If you fish something different than what everyone else is fishing to a highly pressured fish, that can make a huge difference. You're not always gonna be able to sit down and tie a fly that no angler has ever seen and no fish has ever seen that works amazingly well but you can throw different flies that not everyone else is throwing. Some of the most effective patterns that I fish are 40 year old patterns because everybody wants the fly that's the latest, the greatest, the shiniest, the brightest, the coolest looking fly with the most technology in it. And then you throw an old Prince Nymph, a Hare's Ear, a Zonker, an Adams, an Elk Hair Caddis, patterns that have been around longer than I've been alive, and they produce over and over and over again. Part of that is because it's a great and effective pattern that's proven. The other part of that is if the fish never sees that specific pattern that imitates the food that they're eating, they're far more likely to eat it than if it's a pattern that they've seen 30 anglers put over their head that day. Consider some of those old patterns that maybe your parents or grandparents have handed down to you. Some of those old patterns may be the key to picking up that fish that no one else was able to hook.